So we're live. Hey, Fayez, do we want to talk first about stuff or shall we jump right in? We can jump right in. Okay, I'll try to do a short, sweet episode. And I figured we go quickly into what happened. We explain what happened for people who have lived under a rock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we can go maybe into how we experienced it ourselves. And then, you know, like looking a little bit forward, what could it mean for the market? What could, be, could it mean for other projects? And what crazy stuff have we seen online? And, you know, make it like a fun, quick episode for people who, who, who start the weekend. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Great. Well, Fayez, thank you so much for coming on to the show. I'm not going very deeply into who you are because we have a full episode about your story. You are the founder of Blue Alpine Research. You have a community. You have a daily podcast. You are also offering courses and you are also a regular guest on the Kevin Rose podcast, Modern Finance. Although I think this one hasn't been so frequently updated recently, I've seen. Yes, very true. Since the switch to proof, I think he's more focused on the NFT ecosystem since then. Exactly. Okay. But you are also um, part of the proof community, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Did, did I miss something? How would you introduce yourself? No, I think that's the right way. I mean, on one side, educator, trying to bring transparency and authenticity into this market. But on the other side, Uh, some members in the community, in the Discord community, called me Sherpa. I'm not really sure whether this is <laughs> the, the accurate description of what I'm doing, but I'm trying to kind of navigate um, as much as possible this, this craziness called crypto and mm -hmm. trying to obviously also help members and, and customers and, and community members to navigate this craziness and um, yeah, as much as possible. Yeah, and this is a German-speaking community, right, here in Switzerland exactly, and yes. Germany. Uh, the entire yeah. the content is in German, the podcast is in German, the analysis uh, are in German as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's mostly, I would say, about 70% is in Germany, and then the rest is in Switzerland and Austria. Although, to be fair, when I look at the podcast uh, analytics, sometimes I see people in Nigeria, in Bangladesh. And so so shout out to my people, German-speaking people <laughs> over there. Um, so definitely <laughs> worldwide, but obviously a very, very little subset of, of the listeners. Yeah. No, great. So, Fayez, let's quickly summarize what happened. And we can do this together. But I think since you are writing this newsletter um you have this group uh i'll hand this over for you and i just fill in if i see that there's something missing or um you know add some details and some color to it what happened can you can you explain what happened in the last days um yeah <laughs> where should i begin so <laughs> i would say that the main part of this story begins beginning of november so beginning of November, I think on the 2nd of November, there was an article on Coindesk, which showed that Alameda Research, which is a very known venture capitalist, in, a venture capitalist investor, and all around kind of known entity in the crypto space, has about 14.6 billion US dollars in assets. Um, although the majority of these assets are backed in FTT. And FTT is the native exchange token, uh, the FTX token that FTX, the crypto exchange, and was then the second most biggest crypto exchange in the world by, I think, um, trading volume and just general trading volume, um, has created this FTT token mainly because they wanted to create an option to offer discounts for traders that use the platform. So this is an important fact um, of, the, of the entire story. The FTT token doesn't really have any value or utility and can be created by FTX, the exchange. And another very important fact is Alameda Research has been founded by Sam Bankman-Fried um, back in 2017. He has then moved on to FTX, which is a crypto exchange founded in 2019 and has kind of operatively at least left Alameda Research. But this entire story broke. And then since then, a lot of crazy, a lot of different craziness has happened. On one side, for example, Binance or CZ, the CEO of Binance, 
has tweeted out that in part of a deal that they made in 2019, Binance invested into FTX when they were first starting out. And in part of that deal, they received Binance USD, so BUSD is a stable coin, but also FTT tokens. So imagine like um, you're investing into early into a company and this company, instead of giving you stocks, is giving you tokens. And mm -hmm. CZ then tweeted based on the information that came up, he or Binance in general will probably start selling 2.1 billion US dollars worth of FTT token over the coming months in order to not crash the FTT price. Mm -hmm. That, of course, has caused a lot of people to question the validity and the liquidity of FTX as an exchange. So people slowly but surely started to withdraw their money from FTX, the exchange. What started as a con kind of let, let's just remove the money from FTX. I mean, we can we can not, never be completely sure. Uh, immediately within one or two days started to turn into a bank run, like a proper bank run. I think between Sunday or Monday, there were withdrawals of around 5 billion US dollars. And that quickly became a liquidity crisis for FTX, the exchange. So when people started thinking FTX as an exchange is de facto insolvent, kind of the spiral continued and people started withdrawing more. It, they were left on request and couldn't complete their withdrawals. Um, and kind of the FTT token price was also falling very quickly and hence also the value of FTX the exchange because again a lot of the value that FTX has created was kind of locked or collateralized in the FTT token which doesn't really have a counter value and that became so crazy that FTX has faced a huge liquidity crunch and they had to approach different competitors such as Binance in order for them to sell themselves to Binance. So Binance had an offer on the table to buy FTX.com, not FTX.us. Um, and they spent some time doing due diligence. The due diligence process was um, not that fruitful. So Binance declared after about one and a half days that they won't buy FTX. And since then, the craziness has continued. And there are different rumors right now that FTX is about 8 to 10 billion US dollars in the hole. So 8 to 10 billion US dollars are missing in terms of user funds that um, users want to withdraw. The withdrawals have been stopped Tuesday uh, during lunchtime. And since then, nobody really knows what's happening. And a lot of kind of small details in between that I've left out, although I've talked already a lot, um, <laughs> but that more or less covers the, the story up until, I want to say, Wednesday, mm -hmm. what has happened. And just one thing I would like to add is, and um, prior to that, and maybe also a reason why CC uh, wanted to take out this money, uh, the FTT that he owns, or, or not take out, but sell it, was SBF was very active as a in in Washington in the US and lobbying for more regulation, and he got actually a lot of flack for that in from the DeFi community, because um, the DeFi community felt that he wants to kind of position FTX favorably and outlaw DeFi stuff, so on chain stuff. And he also was bad mouthing apparently Binance CC's exchange, and I think there CC realized, okay, um, we really have to cut ties with FTX, and you know, like let's sell all our stuff. And he's done that publicly, and now it's a little bit speculative because we we don't really know. But um, uh, I personally, I don't think he he's done that and could have foreseen that FTX would would crumble. Um, and that he would kind of like trigger this bank run. That's how I read it. Online, you can read all kinds of conspiracy theories and people saying, yeah, it was like the master move um, from CC, tumbling his biggest competitor. Um, I personally don't believe that because he would have shot himself also uh, in the foot and quite, uh, you know, like drastically. What is your take on, on these theories or what other theories have you heard? Um, yeah, there are a bunch of theories. I think you mentioned one of the, the, the biggest ones, which is essentially 
FTX became too big to ignore for Binance as a whole. Um, but at the same time, I think the political angle is a very important one. Um, turns out Sam Bankman-Fried was essentially lobbying against what we stand for in crypto. And I think this is a very important part that um, plays into this whole thing because, and there we go a bit more into the conspiracy stuff, um, Caroline Ellison, who is or was the CEO of Alameda Research, I think she or her professor or her father went essentially to the same school, to the same class as Gary Gensler, the SEC uh, chief. Then Sam Bankman-Fried's mother was um, an important professor as well at, I think, Stanford. So there's different connections, both from SPF as well as Caroline, towards um, making sure that FTX as an entity is trying to become as legit as possible and at the same time potentially bad mouthing other players and mm -hmm. other players don't only mean binance but also the entire DeFi space so i think timing wise it was very interesting that binance or cz tweeted what he did and kind of essentially caused this bank run because if we kind of rewind back the clock it was this article came out after Sam Bankman-Fried made these statements about DeFi regulation. Mm -hmm. And only afterwards did this, the balance sheet leak, for example, they tried to, to play it down. So I think Caroline tweeted that they said, uh, there are other assets on our balance sheets that are not represented in there and that are not collateralized by FTT. But essentially the downfall was after this big statement from SBF, essentially saying every transaction should be uh, observed, no privacy, no DeFi um, frontends or backends in any kind of way, only regulated, controlled entities should be allowed to participate in the market. And I think on one side, this is obviously a very philosophical decision, kind of uh, discussion whether you are in before, uh, like uh, whether you are for or against that approach. But at the same time, you have to be aware that FTX and SPF in the crypto industry, especially in the US, had such a big influence. We shouldn't ignore the fact, for example, that SPF was one of the biggest donors of the Biden campaign as well. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, again, some are conspiracy theories, some are just hard cold facts. The fact that FTX was so well regarded within regulatory entities definitely plays a role um with these whole connections because let's be honest ftx is has its domicile in the bahamas they shouldn't technically be allowed to work in the us at all so that's why they have ftx us but at the same time sam bankman fried as the ceo of a bahamas domiciled um crypto exchange was allowed in front of the senate or in front of different hearings and was allowed to lobby for or against the crypto industry Mm -hmm. Whereas other players in this industry are not only not allowed to do that, it's also impossible for them to enter the US because in the US's eye, um, they are uh, doing illegal stuff. So this mm -hmm. is kind of the, the bigger conspiracy or part truth that I'm seeing here as well. And I think one of the very important things that you've touched on is um, this balance sheet that was leaked was actually from Alameda. And, you know, Alameda is a separate entity, theoretically, not theoretically, it is actually a separate entity of FTX. So even that leak alone wouldn't have been that much of a deal. But what turns out now is FTX has used um, user's fund or must have used user's fund. It's not 100% clear. There's a lot of people, we don't know much about it, but they have a hole in their balance sheet. So they have actually used the crypto that you have paid in FTX that you maybe held there and a lot of players did to lend it out to Alameda to play with that money um, and probably have, you know, suffered a lot with, with unprofitable trades. Um, they held on their balance sheet a lot of stuff that is not very profitable, like the FTT token. I think they had like this other ridiculous thing, the map uh, coin, which was a... Uh, a ridiculous investment that they've done. 
And so the separation between the trading arm and the exchange was not guaranteed. And this is like a capital sin um, when, when it comes to an exchange, right? I mean, the money, you shouldn't touch the money um, that, you, that you pay in. It's like they have, they have used this fractional reserve model that a lot of banks also use, but they have done so without telling um, the users. And they have covered up a lot of kind of like um, probably criminal activities by misusing the funds of users. But, um, you know, a lot of people can read up on this and there will be many articles coming out. There will be proper journalists that go into that stuff. I would like to know from you, Fayez, how did you personally experience uh, these crazy moments, which in, in my eyes is one of the, the biggest things that happened since Mount Gox, um, the Luna crash, and, and, and now the FTX debacle. Um, these are the biggest things that come to my mind. Yeah, same. I, I would say top three, if not top five events in the crypto space and uh, definitely negative. Um, I would also say Mount Gox, although this is probably too far away for a lot of people. So the Terra Luna stuff comes really, really close just in, in terms of impact and how people kind of experience this whole thing. I think the major difference though to Terra Luna is people who invested into Terra Luna did so out of conviction. Whereas with FTX, it was not necessarily a conviction play. It was the, the right thing to do. To use FTX was the most normal thing. You would have expected stuff like this happen from a shady exchange that we or different shady exchanges that we all kind of hear from every day. But you wouldn't have expected this much BS to happen on um, FTX. There were even leaked documents, I think, from Slack messages or Telegram messages from SBF telling his own employees that FTX is like the equivalent of a bank and has the same safety and um, same kind of rules and wants to become essentially an, a bank internally and externally. Hence why a lot of employees have left their salaries and their FTT tokens on the exchange as well. Um, but to answer your question, it was quite interesting for me because I saw the Alameda leak on, I think it was on Coindesk first. And what surprised me the most in this moment, and I think that's what, what caught a lot of people off guard, was FTX had such a good reputation that on Sunday evening, I've read multiple tweets, articles, blog posts, videos where people said there is a less than 1% chance that FTX goes bust. And I was under the exact same kind of um, impression as well. But mm -hmm. in, in, in this way, also shout out to the Blue Alpine community because Sunday evening, I wasn't that active on Discord, but I saw a couple of messages pop off. So I jumped into the Discord and I already saw some Blue Alpine members discussing kind of moving away from FTX because they saw the tweet from CZ and were a bit scared of their funds. So yeah. that's where that's when I realized, okay, this could become serious because if the, I want to say, if we as the super small retail investors are already fearing kind of this, this um, potential panic, it's only a matter of time that um, the big players will, will start removing cash and then it will become a problem. So kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, um, because technically, as far as I understand it, until Sunday or Monday, FTX was fine. But once people started to really quickly remove cash, then it started to become a problem. I personally, I, I remember I waited for one transaction to go through. I waited 12 hours. Luckily, it got through Monday morning. But um, I had some kind of smaller amount on FTX as well. And, and I was lucky enough, thanks to the Blue Alpine community, that I uh, was informed Sunday evening. And mm -hmm. I also tried to inform as many people as possible. In these moments, it's always better to overreact and then realize, oh, I overreacted. It wouldn't have been that bad versus underreacting and then realizing, oh, no, I should have reacted more quickly mm -hmm. and this is exactly what we've done um, and what I've done as well personally 
And I, again, on Monday up until I want to say lunchtime or so, I was still under that impression that FTX going bust, chances are less than 1%. I want to be completely honest because... FTX was on such a good run. I mean, you know this as well. They they were raising at a valuation of 32 billion US dollars. They were the absolute favorite of both Silicon Valley and traditional finance world. The regulatories loved FTX. The top stars, the football stars, the models, the basketball stars, all of these people who started campaigns, they were in the Super Bowl ads. So there was a very, very little chance that you would say, okay, worst case, Sam Bankman-Fried can just pick up the phone and call and get a couple of billion US dollars, no problem. But mm -hmm. I think it happened so quickly that he wasn't able to react quick enough. That coupled with what you just mentioned, I think it's a super important fact, the fact that he started, and I think I we can say he because it was ultimately a very, very small inner circle that was aware of this happening. Leverage trading with customer funds, which is an absolute sin once again, especially if you don't inform them and is highly illeg illegal. And again, it throws such a bad reputation on the crypto space, which makes my and your job obviously much, much more difficult. Absolutely. I also experienced it... Uh... Similar, I was in a coffee, I was working, and then suddenly I've seen ch just like more and more um, people that I sometimes knew or, or sometimes I didn't know them, but, you know, like there was kind of this rumor going around and people were kind of taking money out of FTX and then tweeted about it. And I, I also kind of dismissed it. I was like, ah, people are, you know, FTX for me is, was also the top tier um exchange like i personally for instance wouldn't leave my money on binance because i thought still think maybe to a, an extent although that has changed now a little bit that binance was kind of a little bit a shady exchange although it's the biggest one right and i never had bad experience with it but ftx people that i follow and respect like you know like kobe was sponsored by them with the up only tv all the people that I followed and respected have somehow used or promoted FTX. FTX was the gold standard, so to say, in, in crypto. Even SPF with his effective altruism and kind of like, yeah, he want, just wants to be rich so he can save the world. I have to admit, it resonated with me. I, I thought SPF is a cool guy. Even when he started lobbying, I was still thinking, okay, this guy probably is a net positive for the whole space. I have to be honest. I think people were a lot, they're more sensitive now after the Luna debacle and they move quicker. And then I packed my stuff, I went home and I did exactly what hundreds of thousands of other people must have done at the same time, taking my money out of FTX because I had a couple of thousands lying there. And it took me also hours to get it out, but it got out and I was kind of like relieved and I even tweeted about it. I was like, you know, I don't think it's really necessary, but you know, uh, better safe than sorry. And the next day it collapsed. Like, it, And it was a steep collapse, just like Luna was. It, and that's, I think, so mind-blowing that it's almost like you see a skyscraper collapse in front of your eyes and you, you cannot watch away. I was doom scrolling the last mm -hmm. couple of days, basically, on Twitter nonstop, figuring out, digesting all the information. Uh, I don't know what you've done, but I think you probably have a little bit more discipline too. <laughs> <laughs> to not no, be on Twitter all day, but for no, me, that honestly, was exactly what I've done. Honestly, this is exactly what, I mean, on one side, I had to do, obviously, to keep uh, the members and the community updated. But at the same time, it is exactly how, how you mentioned. It's a car crash and you cannot look away. Um, it's such a weird event, this entire thing, because a lot of the, again, like you mentioned, respected OGs of the game got caught very, very badly. I mean, people were talking 40% of their net worth, 50% of their net worth was lost due to this withdrawal stop that happened. And when I say 40% of their net worth, I'm not talking about 500 francs either. I'm talking about people with double digit millions leaving mm -hmm. money on FTX. I mean, we can discuss the intelligence of these people in a separate podcast, whether you should do stuff like this or not. But again, the 
branding, the marketing was done so well that it was almost impossible to think that FTX would lose so much money so quickly and the withdrawals would stop, et cetera, et cetera. But it just shows, I mean, again, with the Terra Luna stuff, with FTX, with all of these instances, you shouldn't trust specific people. And at, it, it doesn't even matter whether, whether the exchange has proof of reserve, like now Binance does or other exchanges will have in the future. In the end, it's not your keys, not your coins. Mm -hmm. And trusting people or individual people too much can hurt you really badly in, in this situation. How a lot of absolute experts have been hurt, unfortunately, in this, in this uh, situation. Absolutely. And for me, I think this really hammers home the point. You have to, you know, keep your coins uh, on your hardware wallet. Um, be, you know, self-custody is the word, right? Uh, and, and DeFi is the winner, actually, in this whole debacle. Like, nobody's the winner. But if there's a winner, then it's DeFi, because DeFi has performed flawlessly. All the protocols handled the stuff perfectly. And there was even like some tweets that I thought they were interesting um, that said, hey, look, um, when like FTX also did DeFi stuff, right? And they never didn't pay a DeFi protocol, obviously, because you cannot not pay a debt to a DeFi protocol. If you don't pay, you get liquidated. It's automatic. That's that's the beauty of it. So on chain, that stuff worked fine. What again didn't work fine was the obscure system of leverage, of interdependence of different kind of like um, exchanges, etc. investments they've done, like I owe you this and you owe me that and I erase, this is now my collateral and it has this and this value, which is probably not really true, like the FTT token, propped up values, etc. And I even heard, um, I wouldn't say conspiracies, but a lot of people say it already started with the Luna crash because what happened after the Luna crash SBF and FTX, they went out to kind of prop up the other um, companies that had now problems, VCs and other companies, right, that were struggling. They went to them and helped them out with, with money that they probably even didn't have. So I think, uh, or I would say it's highly probable that even the Luna crash basically was the accelerator of, of this whole debacle happening. Did you Did you hear about that as well? Or am I a little bit on my own here? <laughs> No, I, I heard something similar. Yes. I mean, it's, I think, and that's where the whole customer funds part comes into play, right? It's, it mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily their money to play with. It's something if the CEO of a company goes bankrupt with his own personal money, it's something else if the company goes bankrupt. And by the way, all the money that he spent was essentially customer deposit. And I think this is this is a very, very important fact that will have a lot of bad consequences for the entire industry because essentially you have to keep in mind regulatories or politicians, they cannot differentiate between CFI and DeFi. They cannot differentiate between SBF, CZ, all of these people, Terra Luna and the exchange and, and all of these. Like There are a lot of important nuances here where the crypto space as a whole can say, look, it makes absolute sense to do self-custody. It makes sense to have proof of reserves. It makes sense to um, to not invest in, into specific people and, and kind of build your trust into them too much and trust code and all of these things. But politicians cannot make that differentiation. For them, it's crypto equals bad. Crypto equals illegal. Crypto equals people getting funded or VCs or uh, or protocols getting kind of um, money, although their uh, VCs or other kind of institutions getting money from exchanges because they weren't able to kind of function without it. And I think this, it's a super important differentiation that a lot of kind of, I want to say old school people won't get. Mm -hmm. And I felt also that this fear of this collapse and a lot of voices mentioned that this is now having you know second order effects or downstream effects that we cannot even imagine yet right like other entities that have somehow been tangled up with ftx um, uh, a lot of DeFi projects um, that have been 
funded or even held their funds on FTX probably that, that have now troubles. Um, a lot of stuff that is not sure yet what, what is going to happen. Um, and I think we are going into now in a couple of months or maybe even years, I don't know. Let's let's say months is better. <laughs> Where where we just cannot say what 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 are the downstream effects of this um, of this collapse, right? Be it regulatory or be it literally like um, other contagious uh, the projects that are now struggling due to this um, collapse. Have you heard or good theories or or people that you should follow to keep an eye on these uh, potential ramifications? Uh, it's it's so difficult right now because the thing is it's so fresh and the story is essentially still developing um, that essentially what we're talking right now could be kind of old news tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. But just generally, I mean, I do follow Kobe, obviously, because he gets sent a lot of kind of important and interesting stuff. Then there is Hesaka Trades, which was mm -hmm. also super early with a lot of these um, uh, these topics. And then kind of the, the general news accounts that kind of drop the, the, the news the fastest. But these are kind of the, the, the people that I'm at least trying to follow to, to keep myself updated. But again, I think people don't realize what the contagion of this is. If you think Terra Luna was bad, wait until you see what, what, what kind of, kind of uh, dead bodies FTX will bring out of the or onto the table and I think this is going to be much much worse because with FTX you had a lot of institutional or more institutional interest than with Terra Luna which was essentially more of a I want to say retail bust versus FTX do you see it differently is is FTX kind of the bigger thing or the smaller thing uh, compared to to Terra Luna in your opinion damn it's hard to say because um Luna Terra is probably the smaller domino. However, I see a connection from that domino to the other one. And because probably, um, I assume, and I can, I'm not 100% sure, I'm just speculating here, that, that FTX also got in trouble because of Terra and Luna somehow. You know, like um, Alameda, for instance, that they probably have done these are just rumors but for me it's kind of connected i would say you're right ftx is bigger in the sense that it it will throw more shade on the industry um specifically because it was supposed to be the good exchange it was supposed to be kind of like the yeah the gold standard so to say in in crypto exchanges um, that's how they presented themselves that's how the a lot of people you know like kind of took that for granted. SPF was kind of the good guy in, 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 in this whole industry for a long time. And he was like the golden child of crypto, etc. He was on the, the magazine covers. He got a lot of um, smart people um, to invest in them. So that's kind of signaling that as well, that a lot of people have done their due diligence, uh, which was not the case with Luna. Luna was always... <laughs> let's say a little bit more on the D chain side, right? Nobody would have said, "Hey, yeah, Luna Terra, um, that that is a legit project." Just some D chain funds like Three Arrow Capitals, etc., had their money in there. But I cannot um, imagine Sequoia putting money in there, or did they? I'm, I'm not sure. Not sure. I, I mean, so. it, it could be, but I mean, with Luna, there were also a lot of big investors. Obviously, like Galaxy, mm -hmm. for example, was invested into them. And I mean, let's be honest, Three Arrows Capital was very well respected up until the point they went bust. So you wouldn't, yeah. before the bust, you wouldn't have said Three Arrows Capital didn't have any risk management. Of course they had in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, the same thing can be said with FTX right now as well. Especially is, if you look at, not, not specifically FTX, but Alameda, for example, if you look at the interviews that Caroline gave, she was joking about stop losses. She was joking about risk management and all of these things. And of course, some of this is out of context and now getting cut together. But I think the essence is very clear that she was very inexperienced for what she was doing. And a lot of these things went well and they only went well because the market was, was going well. Yeah, but from, from how I um, experience this Caroline person, actually, she, for, for me, 
she only came on the radar now, and that already signals a little bit that um, she wasn't like the, the front-facing <clears throat> person. I even read like a tweet that I thought made kind of sense, like that she was kind of put in charge already on the sinking ship, right? Um, a lot of people have apparently resigned from FTX early on, like earlier this year. And how, you know, it's often that then suddenly somebody gets put in charge and they're kind of a little bit um, the face and the blame for it. But I, I don't think that she was really like the mastermind um, and in charge of, of this whole operation and kind of like the reason they got in trouble. That That's a little bit how I read it. Yeah, that's a fair point. I think um, on, on, on that note, you're right. But still, her statements for the position she was in are, in my opinion, were not appropriate um, to a person of that caliber. Obviously, Alameda Research did deploy a lot of capital into the ecosystem, was very well regarded. So uh, even these statements should have made us a bit kind of, huh, there, there's something there we should have looked at kind of more closely. But again, um, what you mentioned is, is very true. There, are, there have been different rumors or speculations that a lot of the very high up people didn't know about what Sam was doing. And a lot of this stuff was just inner circle stuff, if not only Sam was the only person knowing that he was doing weird stuff with customer funds. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, he's going on to Twitter and saying, I'm taking full responsibility and this and that, which he obviously has to do because of PR. But at the same time, it looks very much like this was exactly the case. A lot of these people were not informed. Otherwise, they probably would have acted or quit much, much earlier than uh, they were able to, to do. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of people, as, as we mentioned, have their money stuck on FTX, right? They cannot, you can, you can log in, you can even trade, but you cannot withdraw any coins or money. Um, and that's crazy. And I've seen some strategies being applied right now. And I think that's quite interesting how uh, traders try to do their best, sometimes out of desperation, sometimes um, they want to make a quick buck and kind of even profit from uh, this situation. Um, I, I wonder what you have seen. I, I've seen the following things and not all of it I understood. One was, for instance, uh, longing on FTX and then shorting the same coin on another exchange. To be honest, I didn't really wrap my head around how that should work. Uh, another thing I've seen is people saying, hey, buy on FTX equity shares, because apparently they offer also shares. I, I wasn't aware of that, but that is then done by a Swiss company. And when they go broke, you might have a chance to get it back because it was basically a separate entity. And the latest I've seen is that apparently people from the Bahamas, like residents or citizens, can get their money out. And so there have, they have been people buying or making KYC with uh, acting there from Bahamas or kind of like finding a person from Bahamas to do it for them and now siphoning money out, which I think is crazy and really dodgy that, that that's even a possibility. I wonder what have you seen? What have you heard? It doesn't need to be in this direction, but that you think is interesting or a little bit crazy and that will go down in the, the history books. I think the to maybe um, kind of mention the first example that you gave with longing and shorting at the same time. I think what happened, especially yesterday and the day before, was that the prices on FTX went really disconnected from the other markets because you essentially couldn't do anything besides kind of on the platform. As you mentioned, you were only uh, it was only possible to deposit for a very long time. It wasn't possible to withdraw. So the prices went really crazy. So kind of this longing and shorting strategy at the same time, people realized that the prices on FTX, essentially it was an arbitrage um, possibility. But uh, let, let's leave that on, on the side for now. I think the Bahamas story is the number one story that uh, a lot of people have mentioned. I think the backstory there is that the, I don't, I don't want to, I, I think it's the state of Bahamas or whatever the entity there is. But Bahamas essentially has forced FTX to uh, give the possibility of withdrawals to Bahamas citizens and um, that all the people or all the FTX customers in the Bahamas were allowed to withdraw their money. So people obviously 
have made two things. On one side, they try to KYC as a Bahamas resident, which is, by the way, highly illegal. Um, the second thing is, and that's also interesting, I've seen a lot of people try to buy up FTX accounts with mm -hmm. residents in the Bahamas. So essentially, they would say, I'll give you 30 cents on the dollar for your account. I'll buy up all your debt. And I think their strategy now is to get kind of a position in the lawsuit that will follow or in the insolvency uh, act that will follow an FTX aside. I think this is a super legally um, complex topic or so on, on the legal side. And especially people who don't know what they're doing, um, stay away from stuff like this because that's super, super, again, super illegal. And you have to be super careful with, with stuff like this. Um, one story that I've heard is also using NFTs on the platform. So FTX as a platform has NFTs. And because it wasn't possible to send funds from one account to another, which was previously possible, they started selling NFTs instead. So imagine customer A and customer B and customer A has a lot of money. They want to get out, but cannot because they're in the Bahamas, but customer B can. So they start kind of essentially selling NFTs for a very high price. And by the way, FTX makes 2% on those NFT purchases, which led to FTX making around 50 million US dollars by um, buying and selling NFTs. And again, this throws a very negative light once again on the NFT space because this will then be thrown together with other marketplaces and on other NFT topics. And that I think is, is a net negative as a whole. But these were the two, I want to say, biggest stories that I've heard how people try to get money out of the system. Yeah, but I, well, I have to wrap my head around it, how it really works. Um, but I, I think <laughs> we're probably not getting into all these details here. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to what length and to what creativity like people come up with when they have money on the line, obviously. And I think one thing that we haven't mentioned and is even an official story is that somehow Justin Sun, the founder of Tron and kind of enfant terrible of the crypto space also, um, yeah, made a comeback and uh, on the crypto scene and has somehow um, an agreement with FTX, apparently, that you can redeem Tron tokens one-to-one -to -one somehow. Did you hear more about that story as well? Yeah, again, super weird story. But before we jump into that, as we are recording this, I'm seeing on Twitter because I just got a message, FTX is officially going for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the United States. John J. Ray III is appointed chief executive officer and Sam Bankman-Fried is resigning. So it's officially over. FTX was not able to raise the 8 to 10 billion US dollars they wanted to raise. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's uh, bad news, you, I want to say. It's, it's you heard terrible it here music. first. <laughs> yeah, heard it here first. Um, but to, to get back to the, to the Tron story, so... Justin Sun, as you mentioned, Enfant Terrible, also known in the crypto space for always jumping in with an opinion and trying anything to, to mm -hmm. market his own chains and his own project, was essentially mentioning the Tron DAO, that they want to kind of buy or facilitate people um, that hold Tron-based tokens to get out of the system. So what has happened is that FTX has allowed specific token types, and these are only Tron-based. So I think it's TRX, uh, BTT, and a couple of others, but only Tron-based, once again, to withdraw their money. And I think it works in a way that TronDAO is taking care uh, on, the, on the FTX side. So TronDAO is paying FTX that these users that have these tokens can get them out, which mm -hmm. is... Now that we think about it, it's kind of a it's kind of a shady thing to do, um, but at the same time, it's also a very heroic uh, action, if you will. But again, that will only um, help one percent, if not less than one percent, of the users. Ninety nine percent of the users are still stuck with their funds on FTX. And on FTX, the Tron token shot up because a lot of people obviously wanted to buy Tron to get out and in the other exchanges it dropped like all the other crypto um, and that's maybe a good keyword one of the big stories was SPF 
FTX was a big, big supporter of Solana and the whole ecosystem there. And so a lot of people would now unstake their Solana and uh, sell it. That was kind of the story yesterday. And then this unstaking happened, but the, this crazy drop didn't happen. I mean, it happened and it didn't happen. It, people were saying like, hey, we're going to uh, sub $10. A lot of people were kind of waiting to scoop up some Solana there. Um, obviously hard to, to discuss prices, but what do you think is going to happen with these projects that were kind of connected to SBF and to FTX in the future? Do you see that this is going to cost them dearly or do you think they still have a survival chance? To be honest, I think it will cost them dearly and we just haven't seen the effects yet. I think the unstaking part that you mentioned was just one part of the equation, but the other kind of bigger part was essentially if FTX and or Alameda go bankrupt, what would happen to the prices? And this is officially now the case, so we will probably see the Solana prices go down. At the same time, I think the only positive thing is Anatoly from Solana Labs has mentioned that they have about 30 months of runway and the tokens or the runway that they have is not in tokens, but in actual US dollars. So at least the Solana Labs team, so the main developers behind the protocol, they will be around for a bit longer than uh, two years. Um, but I'm seeing really kind of bad clouds coming up for a lot of Solana based projects which Alameda Research was essentially invested in, in almost all of them. So I would expect their second order effects to be very rough. Um, this is also, by the way, what, what I mentioned to the, to the community as well, that if you're in Solana-based tokens, um, just be ready to either write them off or ride the wave because it's going to be a huge wave coming onto us. So I still believe we're not completely out of the water yet. Um, obviously, the price has also reacted now uh, from the 17,000s uh, in Bitcoin down to 16,8. And it looks like we're, we're going down because of these news. Mm -hmm. And how, maybe some closing words, uh, Feyas. Um, how do you look f into the future personally or how did that affect you personally? Um, I can maybe say it f for me, it has been kind of... I don't know. I was yes, I was really sad, or like a lot of days. I was the last couple of days. I was kind of sad because, um, yeah, a lot of people have suffered. There was so much kind of um, pain and outrage and drama going on worldwide already, uh, and and this is just like the worst possible time for a lot of people. And I think really this encouraging, uh, discouraging for a lot of people. I don't know, um, maybe. You're also a little bit more on the pulse with, with a lot of uh, retail investors in your community. How was, um, how was the, the sentiment there? In general, very negative. Um, people keep losing trust, obviously, into these big organizations and exchanges. Um, they A lot of people got burned in the Terra Luna stuff. Now they get burned with FTX as well. So they're really frustrated and I can completely understand their frustration, to be honest. Um, and there, is, there was this meme, I think it, it just covers my emotions perfectly. There is this meme, the are you are you all right, son? The dad comes into the room, it's with, with stick, stick man's uh, kind of drawn. And usually the kid is on the computer playing and saying, yeah, I'm making millions with crypto or whatever. And now he's laying on the floor, essentially just super depressed, saying, no, I'm invested in an industry run by clowns. And this is exactly my kind of um, emotional state as well. We're working so hard and so tirelessly to bring more authenticity, more transparency into this industry that is essentially run by incompetent people that are doing bad stuff with a lot of um, good people's money. And it just hurts. I mean, it's it's on one side, I'm super frustrated. Um, on the other side, I am sad as well, because I think short term, this will have big implications for the market. Obviously, long term, I still believe that something like Bitcoin, something like Ethereum, something like smart contracts, DeFi, and all of these topics are essentially needed more now than ever. 
um, the only positive thing I'm seeing right now is the fact that uh, we will probably get proof of reserves without a regulatory pressure, but kind of within the industry. But it needed a huge entity like FTX to go down. It needed a huge bear market and a lot of people having lost so much money for this to go down. And this is just, in my opinion, not just unprofessional, but super, super frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, definitely. Uh, uh, and there was this also this poll going around. I think, are you mad or are you sad? I, th I thought that's interesting because this is kind of the two emotions that I think everybody feels besides that obviously um and i think that's superhuman we are always ho hopeful um we always see kind of like uh the good in the bad as well um one thing that i also felt was kind of like ah oh, maybe now you know it would be a good price <laughs> to to get back into the game etc um I, i think this will never die so the next pump will always be around the question is for me is this really a legitimate industry or uh, is it just like a thinly veiled casino and more and more i feel and see that it's more kind of in the casino area which is obviously hurting the whole space a hundred percent on one side obviously we're also looking at it from investor or trading perspective but to be honest when you're in a I want to say not stable emotional state it you shouldn't make kind of big uh, investment decisions anyway so for me at least I will take a few days and kind of collect my thoughts before I make kind of any big investments or whatever and just kind of uh, uh, digest the the last couple of days um, to 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 really look forward and and understand kind of where we are in the cycle and once again there will probably be some ripple effects and we just have to get ready And again, the goal is to survive. I know everyone wants to get rich in crypto, but the goal is to survive because you're getting punches left and right and it's it's getting more difficult. And, and that is also part of maturing of an industry, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that was a good ending bell. What was that? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> What was that? Uh, something dropped, so the bottle dropped on the floor. <laughs> uh -huh. It sounded like a like a bell somehow. But I think it's a good uh, ending of the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on, Feas. Um, do you have a parting message, or where can people find you? What should people do? A call to action to the listeners. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Fresh Fay um, for my thoughts. Otherwise, if you're German speaking, also if you're English speaking, obviously and want to learn German, check out bluealpineresearch.com, bluealpine.ch. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. If you're still listening, chances are that you liked this episode. DeFi is not just me. It's also you, the listener. And each day, there are more listeners joining, and together we can spread the word about DeFi by giving it five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening. Send this episode to a friend who might be interested. Check out the website, visit DeFi.money, and click on subscribe to get to the new episodes and in the future also blog posts directly into your inbox. Also make sure to follow me on Twitter at DeFiRMoney. All of this helps so we can continue to produce more episodes more frequently and get the most interesting guests that you deserve. Good night and see you soon. <laughs>